So before we wait too long, uh, I'll just introduce myself off the top. Uh, welcome to everyone joining us. We're excited to do this event today. Uh, my name is Tara Sperkerhoff. I'm the Communications Officer for Farm Radio International. Uh, and welcome to our event, A Pandemic of Misinformation, Radio and COVID-19 in Africa. We're excited to get going today, but before we do, a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the event where you'll have a chance to ask questions to our panelists today. Um, so you, if you're joining us via computer, you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a question and answer function. You can leave us a question there at any point during the event, and we'll do our best to get it answered towards the end. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can live, but what we aren't able to answer during the event today, we'll either try to type a response to you or we'll follow up at a later date. So we hope that you have these questions in store and we're excited to, to answer some of them for you and, and really do a deep dive into some of the questions you might have. We'll also be recording this session. So if you found it interesting or if you have to drop out at any moment, um, you'll be able to see a recording after the fact. Just hop on over to farmradio.org, our website, and you'll be able to find it there to rewatch or share with your friends after the event. Now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kevin Perkins, our executive director. Um, welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Tara. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Kevin. We can hear you. Okay, they're just a bit of an echo. I'm sorry. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to see so many of our Canadian supporters here with us for this virtual town hall. Uh, Farm Radio International is all about connecting people with life-changing information from a physical distance over the airwaves. And now we have been using communication technology to bring our Canadian supporters together with the people we work with in radio stations across the continent of Africa. It has been 18 months since our last town hall on the state of the COVID-19 pandemic across Africa. Uh, we wanna give uh, you and other supporters an update so they can hear directly from people on the front lines in Africa and provide an opportunity to ask questions. This town hall, as uh, Tara mentioned, is being recorded. We'll be sharing the video on all our social media channels and via email. Uh, we'll encourage you to share it widely with your friends and colleagues and family so that more people can benefit from this, uh, this conversation. Many, many of you have been part of our work for years and you don't need an extensive introduction to what we do. But for those that are newer to our work, let me just start with a brief overview. We're a 42 year old Canadian charity that brings amazing change to the lives of millions of rural African citizens. We do this by helping over a thousand radio stations in Africa offer their listeners powerful and entertaining radio programs that meet their information needs and amplify their voices and support them in bringing positive changes to their farms, their health and their households. Radio remains the best and often the only way uh, for, for rural communities in Africa to access these services. Um, in Africa, radio is, is a primary or perhaps even the sole source of information for rural people about COVID-19. It is where people turn to get the facts, learn about prevention measures, learn about what they should do if they or their family members show symptoms. It's essential that broadcasters get the facts right, and that is not easy to do. In fact, radio broadcasters can inadvertently spread false information, rumors, supposed treatments, supposed cures. Broadcasters like a lot of us get uh, a lot of information from social media. And social media is great at spreading misinformation. In fact, a 2018 study of the spread of misinformation on Twitter by MIT in the States found that false news stories are 70% more likely to be reach, retweeted than true stories. Falsehoods reach what's called the cascade depth uh, of 10, about 20 times faster than facts. So unless broadcasters can separate fact from fiction and debug myths when they surface, they can inadvertently spread false information, amplify. Uh, so they need access to trustworthy sources to help their listeners stay calm, avoid panic, and make the best decisions. 
Uh, they need to do this safely with their own health in mind. Uh, today's town hall has been organized to provide you with a chance to hear directly from African journalists on how they are serving their listeners with accurate information about COVID in Africa and provide an opportunity for their listeners to ask questions and get them answered. I'm grateful to uh, journalist Blessing, Gozika uh, Uechia, who also works for Farm Radio presently, Francis Azoska, and Precious Naturinda, as well as our own Senior Advisor for Strategy and Growth, Rex Poda, for joining us today. Now I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's town hall, David Gutnick. David uh, will be a familiar name to many radio lovers in Canada. He recently retired um, from his work at CBC Radio, where he was an award-winning documentary producer. He's also served a volunteer mentor and trainer training role for various Farm Radio International programs over the years. And tomorrow, he will officially join our board of directors. And for over three days, as I noted, he was at CBC and he was telling thousands of radio stories about the people he met all over the world. He, um, he was a documentary producer for many of CBC's top radio programs, including Ideas and the Sunday Edition. Uh, Thank you very much for being with us here today, David. I look forward to listening to your conversation. With Hi, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, th thank you so much. And uh, I hope everyone can uh, can is comfortable and you're sitting in front of your screens. You know, it, it, it seems a little strange to be sitting in front of a screen because when I think of farm radio and I think of my experience in farm radio, it's standing in a field and speaking to a fellow who in his left hand, he had a hoe, and he'd been busy working on his manioc uh, field. And around his neck, there wasn't a screen. There was a radio. And he was listening to the local station as he worked. And I thought, this is a kind of miracle that someone can be at work in their field, working away, and learning about how best and how better to become a farmer. And I just thought that this was just the most amazing thing that I'd, I'd ever seen. And so for me, farm radio is that. It's, it's not about screens. It's not about complicated technologies. It's about interacting with regular people as they do their job, as they live in their villages and get on with their lives. And maybe just working with people so their lives get a little bit better. And I find that so exciting. Now, we, all of us from all over the world have lived for the last year and a half, something that's been terrifying, something that's been uh, inexplicable, something we don't understand. COVID has changed all of our lives. And, you know, <laughs> When I think of how Canadians get their vaccines or how Americans get their vaccines, I think, well, how are my friends in Malawi getting their vaccines? What are people saying? What kind of information are they getting? As Kevin just mentioned, uh, disinformation travels so quickly. And, you know, here we are, you know, as, as, as you know, Rex and, and, and Precious and, and, and Blessing, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting around and we're going, okay, as people who talk to the public, how can we make sure that the listeners get the best information that they can possibly get? And I think there's Francis in, 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 in Ghana. So what is he saying to people to help make their lives better? You know, what is Precious doing to help people make their lives better? How do you get your vaccines? What are people saying in the streets? You know, one of the things that farm radio is so good at is what we call shoe leather journalism. That is, you put on your shoes and you go out and you see people. You put on your shoes and you go out and you talk to a woman and you say, what's your life like? Are people talking about vaccines? Are they afraid of the vaccines? What are you hearing on the radio? What are the women saying in the markets? That's what we call shoe leather journalism, putting on those shoes and getting out there. And so today, 
That's what I'm really looking forward to, to hearing. I'm looking to hearing from these wonderful journalists who are out in the field, who are bringing their information back to us so we can think about it and wonder, well, what does that mean in my life? And how do I help people better understand how other people's lives are so we, as a, as, as a, as a global society, can get better, okay? So with that sort of long introduction, I really do uh, wanna talk now with our, first, uh, with our first panelist. And the first panelist we're gonna be talking with is Blessing. And Blessing is a broadcast journalist, educator, and an entrepreneurship coach in Nigeria. Her major focus is social entrepreneurship, community development, and developing better lives for women young people and people with disabilities, which is something that's very important and that Farm Radio has been involved in. Blessing's uh, been a reporter, a host, produced talk shows, and of course, works with Farm Radio International. Uh, Blessing, how are you? Hi, David, I'm Hi. good. Good, that, that's, <laughs> quite, that's, quite, that's quite an introduction. You've, yeah. got, you've done a lot of things. Oh, uh, not so much as you. <laughs> well, bless it. So tell me a little bit about what is what is the situation like in Nigeria right now when it comes to when it comes to vaccines and when it comes to, I guess, you know, like the title uh, says, the misinformation around vaccines. Oh, yes. Um, right now in Nigeria, it's a mix up, you know, um, especially with the learned have different information. The, maybe those in the rural areas have a different um, uh, information. And so there's um, a lot of information out there. Um, and so people choose to believe what they want to believe. And mm -hmm. then, uh, yes, and then the media is also not helping issues because um, there's no uh, um, enough, let me say, in, um, lack of information or no information uh, as um, against misinformation. So because there is no information, uh, any information becomes the information. So, <laughs> so people get yeah information from just anywhere and they believe it. Are, are, do people wear masks or people social distancing? Ah, um, when you come to the urban areas, people wear masks. But um, in the market, everywhere, there's no mask anywhere. So, yes. So among the maybe very educated people, um, people wear masks. But um, when you move around and, like, and when you try to put on your mask, it's like, um, what's wrong with you? There's no COVID anywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is just um, how the case is now so in Nigeria. So what about in your own family? Do you end up having discussions that are difficult discussions with people in the family about, about masks or about vaccines? Oh, yes. We had to have that information, uh, sorry, discussion, because um, at a point we had to stop people um, from coming to the house uh, for us to be able to protect the family. But it looks like um, when you try to do that, um, uh, people begin to, you know, in Africa, uh, we, we are our brother's keepers. So uh, in Nigeria, if your brother doesn't visit you, just because we, uh, at some point we have to have water outside, please wash your hands and then use the sanitizer before coming into the house. You know, it looked strange. People around thought it was a strange behavior, you know. Yes, and um, it's still happening to date when you put on the mask. And then people look at you as, what's wrong with you? Something must be wrong with you. I wish I can just take a snapshot or a video of what it looks like in the street. I just see that everyone is just moving about their normal businesses. So without the mask. So when you're on the radio or, or television, how do you get that message across? Because if you're just banging people over the head, they're not going to listen. Yes. Um, the, there's a lot, a lot to be dealt with first and foremost. Um, most people I've spoken with think that 
um, the government is not doing enough. The, uh, there's this um, suspicion around the issue of COVID. Um, yes, the, the people are suspecting that something is wrong because um, there's a lot of uh, malaria. The, to them, malaria is even killing more, more, more Nigerians than COVID. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To them, insecurity is killing more Nigerians than COVID. And so they think that Niger um, the government should address those issues first and foremost before even talking about COVID. Now, can you get vaccines? So there you are. You're a journalist. Can, are you vaccinated? Can I ask you that? Oh, no. Yeah. All right. Yes. Um, I've not been vaccinated. Um, thank God I came out from... Plato State, Plato State is a different state from where I am now. Mm -hmm. um, we came, yes, we came to do a little um, work, farm radio work, design workshop in Abuja. And so in Abuja, it's a different situation. So from state to state, it's a different situation. Yes, in Plato State, where I was coming from, um, the information is even not there. Yeah, I tried to um, have uh, the, the, the vaccine um, but I didn't even know where to go to. And mm -hmm. then the little information we got to go take the vaccine, we were told that we need to pay 40,000 Naira to take to run the test first before we can be vaccinated. And nobody wants to do that because of the economic situation in the country. But here I am in Abuja, and mm -hmm. just a stone throw from here, it's free. People can test and take the vaccine. So um, it is different from the north to the south, to the west, to the east. Uh, and that's because in Abuja, we have so many learned people in Abuja. So the north, especially the very northeast, um, it's difficult to convince them. Um, to do that, you need to do a lot of um, campaign, especially with the religious leaders, because it has to do with the mindset religious beliefs, uh, suspicion, and all of that. That's, so what, I, I'm gonna finish with this. What is the role then of something like farm radio to speak to, I guess, less people in the cities and more people outside of the cities, farmers, farm families? Yeah, so um, farm radio has done quite a lot in the uh, past one year, since 2020, we've been working with our radio partners to oh. uh, for last year we mm -hmm. even uh, farm radio provided um, COVID-19 funds to all of our radio stations in Nigeria about over 10 radio stations in Nigeria got COVID funds to be able to give out this information and pro uh, farm radio also produced some broadcaster resources um, stories, um, uh, information from the WHO, and a lot of this information we had and we sent out to farmers. Again, we're also using this our radio program to, um, in between discussions, we brought um, medical personnel from the um, certified uh, um, uh, health organizations to talk to farmers on how to prevent uh, uh, COVID-19 and um, also to stay safe. Uh, one of the most important thing we did uh, through Farm Radio um, Partners was that we were able to help um, teach farmers, women farmers, on how to prepare the um, sanitizers locally using the WHO um, methods or prescribed prescriptions to do. So we locally source those materials, source them on radio, mm -hmm. and we have to go to the villages to uh, see how they produce them. So, um, and then uh, they also complained of not having their hand soaps and all of that. So someone taught them how to produce the local soaps that will help them always keep clean. So Farm Radio has done a lot in the past and we're still doing um, our very best to work with our farmers through our radio partners. Bless and so this is yeah. So this should continue. Actually, maybe we should do more. Oh, yeah. Blessing. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I, my heart is beating faster you, because I, I'm just seeing all of the possibilities out there. It's so, so mm -hmm. great to have you here.
Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Next, we're heading over to, to Ghana. We're going to talk to Francis Azoska. And Francis is, a, well, Francis is a teacher. He's also been in, in, in radio for a long, long time. And he's the kind of guy who, he, he says he's results-oriented. And uh, as you'll hear him, he's very, very dynamic. Imagine, he's been working in media now for more than 20 years. And Francis now has a health show, which is very important, a health show out of Kamasi at Garden City Radio. And you can see a picture of, uh, of Francis on your screen. Hello, Francis. Hello, David. How are you? I'm good, and you too, David. So you have a health show. Is that, uh, is that what I hear? Yes, I have a health show, uh, both on television and on radio. So is it all about COVID? Is it all about COVID all the time these days? Well, yeah, um, if, if I could um, take you back a bit on, 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 on this um, topic, especially mm -hmm. on the coronavirus that we are discussing, yeah. I would love to take you, I would love to take you back, back a bit because when the epidemic or the pandemic broke out, I, I hosted um, Director of Health Service uh, in Ghana on, on, on television. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, the Nobel Coronavirus Disease 2019, mm -hmm. uh, which has become a global epidemic, hit Ghana on 12 March 2020, mm -hmm. and in less than a week, increased by over 30 percent with two deaths. Well, as of 11th August 2020, Ghana had recorded over 41,000 cases with over 215 deaths. Well, we had a study where we seek to provide a micro-level evidence on how COVID-19 is posing a threat to some of the sustainable development goals, particularly the effects of COVID-19 on poverty and living standard of Ghanaian household. Now, the negative impacts of COVID shows that COVID has significantly increased the poverty levels of Ghanaian household. Of course, in Ghana here, um, um, agriculture is the backbone of our economy, and about uh, 70 or over 70 percent of the people are engaged in um, agriculture. So we panicked a lot when COVID. Um, by the way, um, it's raining here. I don't know if you can still hear me clearly. Yeah, yeah, I, we can. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So um, COVID really affected um, a lot of people in Ghana. Um, the study also um, discovered that uh, uh, females and rural dwellers were, were most disadvantaged. Of course, you, 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 you agree with me why mm -hmm. female and um, 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 rural dwellers would definitely be a disadvantage when it comes to um, um, COVID-19. Um, a key policy implication from the study is that Ghana needs to um, broaden its social protection program to assist both the new poor and then existing poor. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing out this, 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 I'm bringing this, this, this study out because of what we are discussing and the mm -hmm. kind of work we are doing concerning um, 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 Farm Radio International and our duty. Of course, our, our focus is always on the, on, is always on, on farmers and how to ensure that um, agriculture also grows. Now, this disease uh, to me has really change um, 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 our world leaders a bit. Um, first, first of all, the people or our leaders didn't used to think, I'm um, talking about Africa here, mm -hmm. think about the poor, it's always about them. It's always about them. I mean, sometimes we need to say the truth and then move on. Now, some Guardians also doubt the, the existence of the COVID. As uh, Blessing said, it's not only in Nigeria. In Ghana here, um, some people also doubt the existence of, of, of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. In June 18, in June 18, there was a, a Ghana news agency report. Um, um, although Ghana has reported close to 13,000 COVID-19 infection cases with 66 deaths, yet a large number of the population believe the virus does not exist. So sure. while health experts were educating the public through to Various media outlets, certain sectors of the populace, well, were sharing information 
based on their own conviction and understanding without referring to any authentic and credible sources. Well, well Francis, yes. Francis, I have a question about that because you've been in broadcasting a long time and you understand your audience. How do you change people's minds? Let's say there, there's a, you know, in your mind, a farmer in, in, in his field with his wife and they're having a discussion about COVID. How can you get through to them to make them understand that social distancing, wearing masks, and maybe the vaccine, once you get it, is a good idea? How do you do that? Can you come again? How do you convince, Francis, how do you convince people who are a little bit scared of, 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 of COVID, how do you convince them to wear a mask? Or how do you convince them to, to social distance? Or if, if vaccines become available, how do you convince them that getting a vaccine is a good idea? Well, um, we went into um, a lockdown and when they announced a lockdown, they announced some measures that needs to be taken against this, this pandemic or this virus. So of course, when we sit on television or um, on our radio, we, we convince the people that, hey, the virus, whether you believe in it or not, by what we have heard and what we have seen globally, it is real. And of course, if you want to be safe and save your brother, or your brother to save his brother and sister, you need to protect yourself against these virus. Of course, we have the nose mask always when you wear, especially when you go to public places. If someone sneezes, the possibility that you are able to prevent yourself from catching the COVID is, 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 is about 90%. To make sure you wear the nose mask, to convince them also to do the hand washing, which is also very, very important because even on our normal day and day-to-day -day activities, we take death on our hands. So it's always very important to wash our hands also. And then also use the sanitizers to also clean our, uh, to, to, to cleanse our hands, which is also safer for all of us. We, 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 we convince them that, of course, the vaccine has come. As I said, I mean, a number of people um, didn't believe it, even when the vaccine came. Um, there were lots of people who were not prepared mm -hmm. to go and then take the vaccine. But, of course, we convince them. We ask them that, hey, the vaccine is in here to save you. So why don't you go and then have your job? Have your job, of course, the health personnel in Ghana, most of them, also educated people, and then they, 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 they told them that these vaccines, some of them have their own side effects. So they told them the thing that they should expect when they take the vaccine. A lot of people went in for the vaccine, and when they took them, they had um, a bit of, you know, um, should I say, they were not feeling well. Some complain of fever, some complain of headaches and etc. But they were being informed that mm -hmm. they would experience all these all these signs and symptoms. So when it came that they experienced them, in fact the fear went away. And after that, some people who didn't want to go in for the job went also went in for the job. So Francis, so far I've had yeah. Francis, what you're saying is very you you mentioned something very interesting. I just want to I want to finish with this. You mentioned convincing families. And we know how important uh, women are, working women, working, working women farmers, women who are the head of households. Women have a lot of power in convincing perhaps men that saving the family, saving people from COVID is really important. And I just wonder what you, what you have to say about that. Well, of course, uh, women have the power when it comes to convincing and especially convincing their husbands to do something. Um, for, for, for our rural folks, um, it wasn't that easy. And even till now, I, 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 the rural people don't believe in, the, in, in, in this uh, COVID. They don't believe in the vaccine. Sometimes when you speak to them, they will tell you that they are doing, they are, they are taking their own um, um, local heads. And they believe in their local health that the local health will, 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 will kick away any vaccine in them. They, they, I mean, I think uh, Blessing mentioned something um, concerning malaria and other diseases that are killing Africans. 
or that are killing um, Ghanaians that the government or our various governments are not doing anything um, um, about that. Um, they said a special section of world resources. Of course, um, the, 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 the talk of malaria, the talk of um, um, environmental related diseases, and they said even 11 million children die worldwide annually. And that population equals the combined population of Norway and Switzerland mm -hmm. worldwide. And when we come to Africa, the rural folks are dying out of malaria and um, diarrhea and certain common diseases. We don't have vaccine for all these um, diseases up until now. So how come there's a vaccine for them to there's a, there's, there's, there's a yeah. vaccine for them concerning um, COVID-19? So most of them, you know, um, I would say close their ears. They didn't want to go in for, for, for that. And I'm sure we've not had any, um, we've not gone to majority of the villages in Ghana. So it would be difficult to give a statistics okay. on the number yeah. of uh, our, 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 our rural folks who have taken the vaccine. But I can say at least a couple of them have, have, taken, have taken the vaccine. And we are still convincing them that they should take the vaccine. Though we know that malaria killed a lot. Diarrhea killed a lot, but um, uh, we don't have to wait okay. for um, COVID nineteen to also come and then wipe okay. us off. I mean, okay. Thank you so much, Francis. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, and. Thank you. Uh, that's, so oh, that was that was very detailed and it was fascinating. You pointed out all kinds of, Im, 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 I think, important things for us all to be thinking about. Now, from Francis in Ghana, we're heading to Precious in Uganda. Hello, Precious. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good. Hi, Precious. Good now, I have to. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, there you are in your beautiful big chair. You look you look very, very, <laughs> very important. <laughs> But you are Thank important. You. Precious is a journalist with Uganda Community Green Radio. And she, very interestingly, Precious is uh, very involved in the world of women, International Women's Foundation. She's also a presenter uh, talking, I think, about gender equality and so on. Aren't you in exactly, the, Uganda? Yeah. So, so, yes, this is, so this is what I want to talk to you about. Because one of the things that Farm mm. Radio uh, is very involved in is recognizing the importance, the power of women in communities. And so mm -hmm. when it comes to COVID, what have you been doing to, to, to speaking to, to women in your audience? Um, actually, I've been doing a lot. Uh, COVID-19, I don't know whether you are hearing me clearly or I can switch off the video. You can sure. guide me on that. Sure. I switch off? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's lovely. It's lovely. We've seen you now. Now we want to hear from you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, COVID-19 in Uganda, it broke out in March. That's when we registered our first case mm -hmm. uh, in March to 2020. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, it came at a time Uganda was warming up for uh, general elections which were due to take place in January 2021. And because of that, at first, uh, people were a bit scared. Uh, so the country was put on lockdown after realizing that there are many cases coming up. Then, but at that time, uh, the lockdown was put between around uh, uh, June. Mm -hmm. um, there were less cases, but after uh, they were going into campaigns. So people were looking at it as maybe uh, it is not actually COVID is a hoax, COVID is not real, maybe because we are going into campaigns, into general elections, maybe President Seven is, is trying to play around politics, it is just politics, it uh -huh. is just a joke, maybe people are eating money. But then after uh, elections, after elections, mm -hmm. and the, after easing the lockdown, that is when COVID became real. And now Uganda started registering thousands of cases and we are put back in lockdown again in July this year when the cases were shooting up. So uh, that's when people realized that actually COVID is real. People are dying. Uh, when people were starting to die seriously, I mean, people were dying because in Uganda we have registered uh, 3,000 cases of deaths 
And uh, we also registered COVID cases of around 125,000 cases. So uh, because of that, it was a role as the media to make sure that we dispel these myths and uh, misinformation. What happened at first is even people who had COVID, they were fearing to speak out just because of fear of stigma. People were fearing to come out, to speak, to talk about how their experience. But later after, they started getting used and coming up to speak. So what happened? How was COVID-19 affecting women? These lockdowns affected their livelihoods. These lockdowns actually have affected much children because of the long holidays. They have been in holidays for now two years not going to school. So what has happened? Early marriages, pregnancies. So this is heavily dwell on a girl, child, and women. Ch uh, sick people at home, the elder, the old, the burden goes to a woman. So uh, that's why we are encouraging women, people to come up and make sure that they take vaccines. At first, people were against taking vaccines. Uh, reason being, um, even uh, some people who were supposed to lead us in taking vaccines, for example, health workers, were against it. So if a health worker is against it, David, would you run to, to it? So mm -hmm. it was like people were a bit hesitant to get the vaccines until uh, people started coming up, beating stigma to talk about their experience of COVID-19, to talk about how real it is. People started losing their relatives, friends, parents, children, and I mean parents. And it is really, uh, it became real and people started fearing. So what is happening right now? Uh, right now, people are coming up with like, the uptake of vaccine is actually high. Right now, uh, for example, in Uganda so far, we have around 2.3 uh, million people who are vaccinated and out of those, over 600,000 people are fully vaccinated. They have taken two doses already. That means they are fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And in Uganda, we are now targeting around 4.8 million people by the end of the year. So what are, they, how, what are we telling them? Because they want children back to school, they are really taking it up. They are really yearning for it because the lockdowns have done more harm than good. They don't want to see the livelihoods being affected. They don't want to see themselves suffering. So as journalists, we are playing a very big role to make sure that, uh, first of all, uh, we bring health officials on board to make sure that they give accurate information about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. We are like uh, front uh, frontliners to make sure that we encourage people to make sure that they stay, they stay safe by getting the vaccines. We have to make sure that uh, we put on second, uh, second quotes to explain to people like uh, about COVID-19 and its effects, looking at like bringing out how it has affected people. It helps them better to come out and take vaccines willingly, looking at the effects looking out how it has affected people's livelihoods, bringing out the stories of people who have suffered from COVID, their experience and how it feels like. Wow. So because of that, people are coming up to make sure that they get the vaccines. But it's at that... first, it was not easy at all to convince. At one time, my mom called me as she got the first vaccine, the first jab, yeah? But then yeah. after that, she was relaxed. She was like, precious, I'm not going back. They're telling me that people getting the vaccines are dying. Yeah. So what am I doing? Oh, <laughs> you that's your own mother. That. But then there was her neighbor, my own mother. Then there was uh, her neighbor who had come from the second. So she was like, she had come from taking her second jab. So she was like, I will first monitor this woman. I see how she will be. <laughs> You can imagine that. And after she realized that actually this woman has no effect, the, the, the COVID vaccine has not affected her at any time. And that's when she was convinced to go there and take the second job. So you see uh, people are hesitant, but for now they are coming up in large numbers just because they are tired of the lockdown. The children are being affected by the lockdowns so much. So they feel like they should also, it, it should be like teamwork of getting the vaccines and they get out of this. Of this because yeah. President Museveni is saying he can only open schools when he has at least vaccinated uh -huh. around 4.8 million people in the country. 
And I remember in the country altogether, we are around, we, are, we have a population of 40 million people. That means we still have a long way to go. So uh, right now, I think if we keep collecting the vaccines, what the country has done is to make sure that they put, they open different vaccination centers at public places, they say at churches, uh, near marketplaces, make sure that people come up for vaccination and make sure that at least we get the targeted number. You know, Precious, listening to you, you're such a wonderful storyteller. Uh, I could listen to you all. I could listen to you all day long. But what I'm hearing like is this: that. that when you're mm -hmm. doing your radio programs, you're bringing yeah. on real people because though your yes. audience will believe real people. Is that um, not only, yes, not only real people. But also as journalists, it's our role to make sure that we get as enough information as possible and we get closer to health workers to explain. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Farm Radio International, they have been even sending us resources to use. So even if those ones can help us, but most especially hearing a real story of someone who has suffered from COVID, it really creates an impact. And even uh, using opinion leaders, uh, local leaders, uh, for example, here they believe much in the traditional rulers, for example, for kingdom. So having, for example, the cathedral of the kingdom, the prime minister of the kingdom getting vaccinated, mm -hmm. we use that to give a message to the public to say, look, for my, I'm already vaccinated. Why can't you as well go and get vaccinated? A church leader getting vaccinated, we use such to make sure that they change the mindset of the public. So you're always looking around for new angles, new ways of getting yes. that information out there, out there. Exactly, wow. getting new angles. Uh, because at first people were fearing to speak out, for example, we had to first tackle the issue of stigma. People fearing, because even those who would feel they have COVID, they would, one, fear to go to the hospitals, maybe because of the bills in the hospital. They just keep there. And there is this, remember, our neighbor in Tanzania at first, we against, it was against COVID completely. The former president, uh, John Pombe Magufuri, who passed away, may he rest in mm -hmm. peace, he was completely against like people getting vaccinated. And for them, it was business as usual. They were not so much strict on masks and the rest. And now people would ask, why is it that our neighbor in Tanzania, they are not bothered about the masks and they are not dying. But the issue is, at some point, Tanzania stopped uh, it stopped publishing results, COVID uh, cases. So it was just, I think the, it was to them, it was not known to the public. Uh, we also had um, uh, Burundi was uh, somehow relaxed on COVID-19. So you realize that our neighbors, people are questioning, if our neighbors are just relaxed, what about us? Maybe there's something behind that. Maybe COVID is not real until it started killing people seriously, neighbors, relatives, friends. Oh. And everyone was just giving a testimony. Oh, that is precious. Th thank you so much for, for or I, <laughs> the hair on the back of my neck is standing up right now because when you, the, mm -hmm. the way you describe all of this going on and the importance of what you're doing, it's, uh, yes. it's, ama it's amazing. So th thank you so much for taking the time for this, uh, this interview today. Wow. Thank you, John. Yes, thank you so much, Precious. And from Uganda, You're welcome, David. thank you so much. And from, uh, from Uganda, we're heading over to Malawi and we're talking to Rex Chapota. And Rex has got lots of experience in international development. He's, he's, a, he's a leader who has been involved for, for many, many years in mentoring people, being involved in media, being involved in the, the, the modernization of agriculture in, in in Malawi, and of course, he leads the growth and strategy portfolio at uh, Farm Radio International. And uh, Rex, it's so good to uh, to have you sitting there with your headphones on. How are you? I'm great. And how are you, David? I, and no, I, 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 I have to let our audience know that you have a private technician at home who helped you uh, <laughs> get ready for today. It's, it's very good oh, to have a you know, Oh, yes, my wife did a good job for me to be ready for 
start with me. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, so Rex, now you're, you're, you're the, the fourth person uh, we're coming to today. Are you hearing the same kinds of things where you are in Malawi as what we heard from Uganda and Ghana, Nigeria? Yes, David. I think the issues are common, but it's not also just hearing about the issues. It's about experiencing the issues themselves. Personally, COVID-19 is no longer a story. It's an experience. It's real. Mm -hmm. When you know it's real, there is a new way you start to handle issues of information. So indeed, misinformation is everywhere, but day in, day out, things are changing as people experience the realities of COVID-19. Now, I, I'm going to ask a personal question here. Uh, yes. Are you vaccinated? Have, did you go out and try and get vaccine? I got vaccinated, I would say, by the biggest push I've ever done in life. <laughs> Tell me about say, that. Yes. You know, we have got AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in Malawi where you need two doses. Mm -hmm. So when I got the first jab, it was better. But the second jab around June of this year, at that time, we never knew when vaccines would be in the country again. Mm -hmm. For two days, two working days, I couldn't do any work because I was on the line trying to get vaccines. And not just sitting or standing on the line, drooling to make sure I can get inside the vaccination room. It was really laborious. But after those two days, I didn't get the vaccine. What happened? The, oh, yeah. Because it ran out in that central hospital. And I heard that there was vaccine some 200 kilometers from our city. And because I had a car, at least I had to drive 200 kilometers to get a vaccine. And when I reached at that healthy center in the outskirts of our capital city, it was the only 10 doses left. And it was one of the people getting the 10 doses left. And to me, it was like, I've gotten all what I could get in the world, but it was just vaccine. It wasn't easy. Now it's better. But that time, it was death or life. Get it or you're in trouble. So in your own family, your cousins, your brothers, sisters, what kind of, what kind of talk is there? Is everybody like you? Is your whole family, is the whole Chipota family uh, convinced that this is a good idea? I would say because, as I said, we have experienced it. I lost my in-law. My elder sister's husband passed on. People in our church have passed on, like tens of them who are my peers. My own nephews and nieces have had COVID-19. So it's a reality and it has hit us home to the extent that everybody now knows that this is not a joke. To the extent that we have now become the news carriers ourselves to say, it's not about what you just hear about what people say on social media. We have lived it, we've seen it, and that's why it's critical to vaccinate. So in my family, everybody's vaccinated and our children every single day when they're going to school, they've got you know, uh, uh, their own children type of masks, you know, they're supposed to put on. So it's, it's just become a reality and when people come into my house, they know they need to wash their hands before they come in. And they think that I'm taking it too far, but it's not taking it too far. It's just understanding the realities of COVID-19. So, so Rex, when you're listening to other radio stations, are you hearing misinformation? Like, do you start jumping up and down and yelling at the radio? Actually, I'll tell you this. The biggest challenge is not just what you're hearing on the radio is the broadcasters themselves, because they are also human beings, you know? So you, you need, first of all, to deal with the broadcasters and 
deal with their fears and misconceptions and myths because they stay in the society. But what we are seeing much more now is that at the radio station level, things are getting better, mm. but on social media. Social mm. media is the biggest gamble now because everybody is sending every message and so many myths and misconceptions. And at times when people see you, you're washing your hands, you're wearing your mask, people think you're taking too far because of this kind of misinformation. And indeed, we need to deal with that because it's destroying people and it's making people not even take vaccines when now they are available than it, it was like four or five months ago. Wow, Rex, I want you to be my teacher because you're such, <laughs> you're, you're, you're just so passionate about this. Thank you so much for, for telling me about what's happening in, in, in your own family. That was, that was an amazing story you told about you getting in your car and wow. Yeah, I know it was, it was, it was something else. I'll never forget about it, you know, but I feel now more confident and I know I did the right thing at the right time. And because of that, I'm more safer. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much, Rex. Well, so you've heard from pressing, from Precious, from Blessing, from Francis, and now from Rex. And now, uh, I mean, it was just, what a great discussion that was. And uh, now I'm going to pass the microphone over to Tara Sprickerhoff, who is the communications officer for Farm Radio International. And I think you are about to pop up on the screen right now. Hello, there you are. I am indeed. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for those really insightful conversations with, with our guests today. Um, it's been really great to hear about all of these different perspectives mm. from different parts of Africa. Um, and now we want to turn it over to, uh, you know, our audience who's listening today uh, and would welcome you to ask any questions that you might have for our panelists. Uh, there's a Q&A box at the bottom, or if you're having difficulty accessing that, you can throw some questions in the chat. But I'm actually going to start uh, with actually another question for Rex, believe it or not. So I know, David, you just asked Rex about getting annoyed or, or being frustrated by misinformation and disinformation. And hmm. so, Rex, my question for you uh, that comes from, uh, from us, I guess, is how is Farm Radio working kind of across the continent to ensure that broadcasters are equipped with the right information and with accurate information so that they're not spreading that, that sort of disinformation that we don't want to hear. Thank you, Tara. Actually, I think the work of Farm Radio has been amazing during COVID-19 pandemic because Farm Radio deals with the people who speak to the people. You know, so mm -hmm. we make sure that the broadcasters have got all the critical information they need for them to be able to share real stories and facts and not myths. Because we do know at Farm Radio that sharing ignorance is even bad as not sharing anything at all. So that has been very great. And also we've been able to have online communities of broadcasters that have had across like 12 countries. We've been able to share resources to over 1,000 radio partners that we have under our network in around 41 countries. But also we've been able to have a chance for broadcasters to ask questions themselves mm -hmm. so that they can be able to know how to handle those questions. And to me, that has just been incredible. And in most of the cases, we have ensured that our ongoing radio programs can have information, can have jingles and sports concerning COVID-19, knowing that indeed our major clients, being the rural farmers, are the ones who don't have got all the information and they can only get this information from radio. So that has been the kind of work we are doing. And we need to do more because COVID-19 is dynamic. You can't only do it in three, four months and you finish. You need to continuously engage and share this kind of information. Wonderful. Thank you, Rex. Thanks for sharing that. Um, our next question is for Precious. 
So Precious, I know uh, you you talked uh, so passionately about the work that you've been doing, and you've been doing this work for day after day for a year and a half now. Um, so, like, are you tired? How do you keep the energy to keep going? Sarah, I'm not tired and I'm not about to be tired because this is like a passion. To me, the journalism I'm doing is a calling. I feel I should serve a healthy community. So if I achieve my goal of having everyone fine, then even if I go home and sleep hungry, so I'm not about to be tired. I feel this is a calling to me. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, Francis, I, I mean, you're in the same boat as Precious. Uh, so I wonder uh, what keeps you going? And, and on top of that, what are the reactions to, to your shows been? What are you hearing from your listening audiences? Well, um, we're not going to get tired for this work. Um, we are so passionate about this. I mean, we love the work that's what we're doing. It. Um, we do it for the people, um, like uh, Precious just said, it's a calling. So we're going to work and we'll work and work and work until maybe we go on retirement. Even you know, on retirement, I'm sure we'll still work to ensure that we educate the people on, 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 on what is good for them and what will improve their lives. We're not going to get tired, Sarah. We're going to continue doing it. Thank you, and, and thank you both for, for the work that you have been doing. It's uh, essential and key to your listening audiences. Um, I think uh, we're, we're coming to the end of our program, so I might just ask one last question to Blessing. And, you know, you say that um, you've had plenty of conversations with broadcasters and, and talking to them about the types of questions that they have. And so what are the types of questions that you have gotten and, and how have you responded to them? Okay, um, thank you, um, Sarah. Yes, talking with um, journalists and not just journalists, but uh, many of our Nigerian people um, we've been speaking with them and, you know, the questions they ask are so numerous, you don't even know where to go to. But um, the good thing is uh, the radio is a very good um, uh, medium to pass this message, mm -hmm. especially our radio partners. The good thing is that they are beginning to understand that um, we are taking this very seriously. And again, it has to do with a lot of mindset change. And so um, talking, we must continue to talk. And um, mm -hmm. who knows, very soon everyone is going to come to our side. And especially if it's possible for also or, um, to get some government people to also um, help with information as to where to get these vaccines and um, to test, also to run this test, it will be fine to have people have it and test it, especially government to start again by taking the test publicly and taking the vaccine publicly. Do it help for everyone to see and know. Yeah. Great. And I think uh, we might have one more question here. Uh, just let me pop it over. Um, Sorry, I'm just scrolling through here to find the question. Um, just let me pause because I don't see it. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I'll actually say thank you to everyone who, who has joined us today. Um, we've really appreciated uh, your work. Um, it's clear that more information is always needed. Uh, it's clear that this sort of information has been super valuable. And it's clear that, um, and I just want to actually say this, that it's it challenges with misinformation are things that are happening across the world. It's something that's happened here in Canada. Uh, it's stuff that happens in the United States. It's things that happen in Europe and it's things that happen in Africa. And it's a challenge that I think we're meeting together. And I think um, radio is a, a really good uh, way of approaching that. So. 
If we didn't get to your question, I apologize we didn't get to it. We're just wrapping up at the end of our show and we'll hopefully have a chance to answer you via email or send some form of question there. So thank you for joining. And just before we end, I'll pass the mic back over to Kevin, our executive director, to take us out. <clears throat> thank you, Tara. And thanks everybody. Um, it's been a very fascinating uh, discussion uh, for me, and I think what we've um, what we've heard about is really the, the, the multitude of challenges uh, around um, responding to COVID nineteen and, and the really important work that uh, broadcasters and radio stations are are playing in meeting that challenge. Uh, something that struck me uh, a common feeling like look pandemics, health crises, whether it's malaria whether it's uh, uh, intest gastrointestinal diseases are like an epidemic in, in our countries and take many lives. And how come suddenly we're getting attention for COVID when these, so, so, so there's that kind of a, a need, well, wh what is it about COVID that we need to respond to now? And then the combination of, uh, of, uh, of bringing in the voices of trusted experts and opinion leaders, but also as, as David was saying, the, the shoe leather, the, the neighbors, what do the neighbors experience? People like me, how are they experiencing this and how has it been for them? Uh, so really a critical role for, for the broadcasters. We've heard some of the best examples of that combination of bringing uh, the stories of, of regular listeners and, and, and their neighbors and their, what they're seeing and experiencing and, and, the, and the voices of, of health uh, specialists who can answer questions with facts. Um, these discussions remind us uh, that in, in times of uh, crisis, you know, radio is really something we can all count on and it's a, a crucial role to provide accurate and timely information at scale to millions. Uh, and, you know, wanted to remind you, uh, we're fundraising, we're, we're encouraging uh, our support to help us do more to ensure that African uh, broadcasters continue to have the most up-to-date information on the virus and vaccines. We're, we're putting in place a plan for a, a vaccine confidence campaign with our radio partners and broadcasters because they're trusted and they're best placed to get good information to the most remote communities in Africa. If you're able to help ensure they have access uh, by contributing, we'd be really grateful. If you've already supported them, thank you for that. Um, Tara is going to share the link to, uh, to a place that you can go to uh, to make a donation if you're able. Every bit helps. And, and again, if you've already supported us, thank you so much for that. Um, take a, this moment also to give a special thank you um, to everyone who joined us and our panelists, Precious Naturinda from Uganda Community Green Radio, Francis Azoska from Garden City Radio based in Ghana, Blessing uh, Uchia, who is a, a journalist, but also Farm Radio International's project officer in Nigeria. Rex Chipota, uh, Farm Radio International's growth and strategic opportunities advisor from Malawi. Um, and of course, a uh, huge thank you to David uh, Gutnick for, for being the host. What a master. And uh, it's been a real treat to, uh, to observe the, the great interactions he's had uh, with our special guests and panelists. Uh, also, let me uh, be sure to thank the staff for organizing today's session, in particular, Tara uh, Sprickenhoff, who has really played the key role in making this happen and for being our host. Thank you, Tara. Um, again, this has been recorded and we'll be sharing the video uh, in various channels and, and please uh, invite you and welcome you to share it uh, with your networks. Um, so that's, that's where I'll close now with a, a big thank you to everyone for participating and wishing you a very good day.